Well, welcome again. Thank you, Marcy and Terry and music team and everyone making worship possible this morning. We continue our series, Fired Up, as we are discovering the life of adventure in faith in the early church and the life of adventure, hopefully, in our own lives, individually, families, and our family of faith. And this morning, we are in Acts 21, verses 1 through 19. And Paul is on his way to Jerusalem soon. After we had torn ourselves away from them, we put out to sea and sailed straight to Kos. The next day we went to Rhodes and from there to Patra. We found a ship crossing over to Phoenicia, went on board and set sail. After sighting Cyprus and passing to the south of it, we sailed on to Syria. We landed at Tyre where our ship unloaded its cargo. We sought out disciples there and prayed with them seven days. Through the Spirit, they urged Paul not to go to Jerusalem. When it was time to leave, we left and continued on our way. All of them, including wives and children, accompanied us out of the city. And there on the beach, we knelt and prayed. After saying goodbye to each other, we went aboard the ship, and they returned home. We continued our voyage from Tyre and landed at Ptolemais, where we greeted the brothers and sisters and stayed with them for a day. Leaving the next day, we reached Caesarea and stayed at the house of Philip the Evangelist, one of the seven. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. After we had been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Coming over us, he took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and feet with it, and said, The Holy Spirit says, In this way, the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people there pleaded with Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, Why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I'm ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. When he would not be dissuaded, we gave up and said, The Lord's will be done. After this, we started on our way to Jerusalem. Some of the disciples from Caesarea accompanied us and brought us to the home of Madison, where we were to stay. He was a man from Cyprus and one of the early disciples. When we arrived at Jerusalem, the brothers and sisters received us warmly. The next day, Paul and the rest of us went to see James, and all the elders were present. Paul greeted them and reported in detail what God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. May the Lord bless his word to our hearts and minds this morning. Well, wow, we've been on a journey, and hopefully it has been an exciting one for you as we've looked at opening our hearts and lives to the Holy Spirit and the adventure of life in the Spirit. And uh, uh, we look at this, and this morning we're looking at turning the world upside down. And hopefully our lives of faith are like that. We think about worship as well. It's always great to have excitement in worship. It was great to have the Perduets here last week and all these young people. And, and as I was thinking about that, just Tuesday, as we're waiting for the Perduets to come that Sunday, which is a week ago Tuesday, I came into the church, all the lights were out, and I spend time every week in, in prayer to sort of... Um, lifting up the church. People have expressed need for prayer and uh, spending some quiet time praying for the Lord's leadership and direction. But as I came into the sanctuary, I saw something up front here, and it, it kind of looked like a squirrel. And I thought to myself, I, I wonder if, if Janice is going to decorate something for fall, right? And because uh, and, it didn't move. But then as I looked harder, I thought, that is a squirrel, isn't it? And so uh, I sized up the squirrel, and the squirrel sized up me, and I decided that I needed a plan of action, so I quietly went over, well, he had his eyes laser locked on me, and I went to the sacristy, and I got a wastebasket, right? That was a good plan of action, and then I came back here down the aisle, and I got him, and of course, you know, he was good. He was, he was just a baby squirrel, but he seemed to be good at this, so I got him, and he goes up to the corner. I thought to myself, he's right there in the corner by the stained glass. I thought to myself, oh, I got him now. I got him. I just used the waste paper basket. I just put it over him, and no problem. And I got really close, and he went straight up the stained glass. And I thought, man, this guy's, this guy's good. <laughs> so he was sitting up there looking at me. I'm looking at him, and I did what any sane person would do. I called for backup. <laughs> I sent a text to Jay House and Don Partlow, and I gave him the picture of the squirrel that was up there, right? So um, Jay said, I'm in Frankfurt, keep me posted. <laughs> Don, I don't know how he found this so fast, sends me a link to the YouTube video, The Mississippi Squirrel Revival by Ray Stevens. 
I don't know if you've ever seen that. Don't look it up now. You can wait till later. But about this squirrel that gets loose in this worship service, right? Unbeknownst to people and climbs up people's pants and dresses. And there's like a revival like never before, right? And I thought to myself, that's not what I needed, okay? It's funny, but the Purduettes are coming this Sunday. That's the last kind of revival we need. So uh, uh, then I turned around and I found out it was a flying squirrel. How you say did I find out it was a flying squirrel? Because it flew from there down to over there. And I went like, man, this thing is good. So I did <laughs> my best to go back that way while he was there, and I opened the doors of the sanctuary. I thought the number one strategy is to get it out of the sanctuary, right? So, so eventually, didn't make it easy on me. I got him out of the sanctuary, closed the doors, right? Called Teresa from the office. She helped me close the doors. And then I got him over in the corner of the gathering space. I'm giving Jay and Don a play-by-play and a few photos along the way. So uh, Don said he's on the way. And um, so Don arrives. We got him there, and we finally chased him out the door. So he's out there. He's set free. And uh, and I just re- drew a big sigh of relief because I could only I had all these images of this squirrel getting loose with the Purduettes here. And then Don says, I wonder if it had any brothers and sisters. I said, man, that's not the word of encouragement I was hoping for. So I didn't mention it last week that the Purduettes were here, but I did pray silently that it didn't have any. But that might be a question for you this morning to think about, hey, did it have any brothers and sisters? Well, you know, I hope it's not a squirrel that brings revival to us, but the Holy Spirit. But sometimes there are some moments of humor in the life of faith. And we've been talking about as we went to, as we're going through Acts, we're going to wrap it up, go uh, all the way to uh, Advent with this series in this great book of Acts is the life of the early church, the Holy Spirit on fire through all these different individuals as they continue the work of Jesus Christ. We talk about opening the windows, even as they did in that first Pentecost Sunday and uh, and Acts and the Holy Spirit came, and different moments of Holy Spirit moments all along the way as people have been uh, showing their gifts and talents and serving the Lord, loving and serving God, loving and serving neighbor. And we've been looking at three questions. What is your level of passion, right? What is your level of passion? What is your level of uh, giving of your gifts and talents? What gifts and talents do you have to share and to give and to offer to God and to serve others with? And then what is your level of resilience as we all face challenge and adversity in life? And just for the last few weeks, we looked at this journey of Paul. We've been on the second missionary journey and moved into the third missionary journey. Uh, We talked about Paul as he was in Thessalonica, and Paul was accused of turning the world upside down. Not just Paul, but the whole early Christians. And I said, man, that is what we all need to be accused of, is to turn the world upside down in in a good way, in terms of values, in terms of enthusiasm, in terms of serving others. And then Paul went on, to, um, he went on to Athens, and we talked about Paul in Athens as he's engaged the culture of the day. Without church speak, right, he engaged people who are different philosophies, the Esthenes and the so- people who are following Socrates and all the different philosophies of the day, and engaged them and challenged us to do the same, uh, to be able to talk about our faith experience in a way that didn't rely on church speak, that really engages people, particularly in a world in which so, is so unchurched today. And then we, we looked at Paul in Corinth as he challenged the people there with the fundamentals of faith and the hope of the resurrection and the true wisdom of God. And then we looked at Ephesus, and Paul talked to them about the Holy Spirit and about how the Holy Spirit is there to encourage and to enlighten and to empower. And the Holy Spirit is there for us in the very same way. And then last week we looked at Paul as uh, Paul was preaching And Paul was sharing in Troas, and Paul knew it was his last day there, and he just got so enthusiastic about the word. He went on to midnight, and a young teenager fell out of the window and died. And Paul prayed, and he was raised into life, and then Paul went on until daylight. But we saw this endearing moment where Paul was there with the Ephesian leaders, and Paul is is, uh, praying for them, and they're weeping and praying for Paul, and just this beautiful moment of surrender. And now Paul, as he's on this third missionary journey, has stopped at a number of places, and Paul's destiny, Paul's destiny is Jerusalem. And there's some photos up here. If you'll take a look at those photos that I got a chance to take of Jerusalem, very moved by that. But Paul knows that danger awaits him in Jerusalem, and yet he's, he's determined to go to Jerusalem despite that. And it reminds us of when Jesus, remember, was on his way to Jerusalem, and the disciples said, don't go to Jerusalem, right? 
there's trouble there. And Jesus said, it's, it's my destiny. I need to be about my father's business. And Paul has that same mindset. But Paul is empowered by the Holy Spirit, and he wants to get there. And amazing things are, are happening there. And then uh, we see a moment here that is really amazing because we see Agabus, who is this person who comes and feels strongly, so strongly that Paul is facing danger, that he does this thing with this belt of Paul. says so Paul takes off his belt, and he binds his hands and his feet. And he says, if the owner of this belt goes to Jerusalem, you will be bound just like this. But how would you feel if that happened to you today? You knew danger was there. Everybody around you knew danger was there. And then the word of the Lord comes to you and says, yeah, yeah, you're going to face trouble. Be affirmed of it. And what does Paul do? Paul says, listen, I I'm not only willing to be bound and thrown in prison. I'm willing to go to death for Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. And I just Think about today, and what is your level of passion? What is your level of being able to share your gifts and talents, your testimony? What is your level of resilience as you face challenge and adversity as all of us do, and you see Paul setting the pace for all of us in this incredible way? And it is just so powerful. And so Paul does go to Jerusalem. <laughs> and right there in Jerusalem, as Paul finally gets there, what happens? People incite a riot. Paul is once again turning the world upside down. But Paul is not going to shudder his testimony of faith and his belief in Jesus Christ no matter what. And so this riot breaks out, and uh, the, the Roman legion has to come and rescue Paul. So it's the Roman soldiers that come and rescue Paul in this environment because they wanted to shut this down. That riots weren't good in Rome. Riots aren't good today. And so uh, Paul is in prison. Wow. Can you imagine that? Paul is in prison. And, and this section sort of covers 21 through 25, roughly, but I just want to jump ahead for one second here. Or actually, it's part of it. In, in 2311, uh, the Lord comes to Paul in the middle of the night and says this, Take courage, as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so also you will testify about me in Rome. Wow. Paul has a vision in the midst of his trial and adversary, and, and as he meeting the adversity in prison, God comes to him. And I want you to know, you might not be Paul this morning. All of us face challenge and adversity, but you know, God comes to us in our, in our moment where we're in the darkest night. Sometimes God is closest to us in that darkest night, because the darkest night allows the candle to shine brighter. And the Lord comes to Paul himself and whispers these words of encouragement to Paul. The Lord doesn't say, I'm going to take away all the challenge and adversity. The Lord says, take courage. I'm going to be with you. And that's the promise you can always hold on to in all of our lives. And I want to just invite you to hold that promise in your heart this morning with whatever challenge and adversity that you're facing. And so Paul, while he's in prison, there's a, there's a plot that's brewing against Paul. And a nephew of one of the relatives comes, and he shares that. And that young person is sent, young person following the Spirit's lead, is sent to the head of the Roman guard and, and tells the Roman guard what is going on. And they decide what they're going to do is to smuggle Paul out of Jerusalem in the middle of the night. <laughs> so literally, the Roman cavalry comes to rescue Paul, <laughs> turning the world upside down. Man, so they, they send a whole a, a detachment of soldiers and the cavalry for Paul, and they sneak him out in the middle of the night. I guess they thought it was troop move or something, but there was the Apostle Paul. And they take him up to uh, partway to Caesarea, and then the detachment leaves, and the cavalry takes Paul up to Caesarea. And wow, what about Paul? How about that moment? Now, in the next slide there, I want to show you, this is some of the slides from Caesarea. Now, Caesarea was a city that was created to honor Caesar, but it was a brand new city at that time created. And it's, it's a beautiful city, by the way. It's right on the Mediterranean Sea. I mean, it's stunning. Like, and uh, I was there really on my trip, and I just loved it. Uh, but you can see, actually, they've excavated much of it. There's an there's a amphitheater that's there. Uh, there's actually a horse track that's still there. You can see that. Uh, you can see the ruins of the palace and uh, some of the ruins in the distance. And then you see that right there on the top middle it's like a well with a grate over it. That's a prison. That's a prison. And that prison, most assuredly, was where the Apostle Paul was taken the first time that he arrived in Caesarea. But Paul was undaunted. You can look down in there, and there's some engravings right there. 
doesn't look like we think of a prison. It's more like a well, like Joseph, right, in the well, right? It's that kind of a prison. Paul's alone there. People are free to throw stuff down or yell at Paul or whatever. Paul is undaunted by that. And then Paul is struck before the authorities. It's been Festus, and then it was, it was Felix, then it was Festus. But first with Felix. And Felix wants to know what's going on. <laughs> and so they have some people that come, and they accuse Paul. And then Felix says, well, wait a second. But this is, this is, there's no crime here. This is like you believe one thing, and he believes something else. And, you know, and so they try to accuse him of inciting a riot. And then they say, well, you know, Paul was rescued. And so it's interesting because uh, Felix's wife, Drusilla, seems to know about the way. Now, what is the way, by the way? You've heard that a number of times in Acts. The way is the original way that people refer to as Christians. And sometimes you see the Bible up there, the way with a couple, capital W, the way. Jesus was the way, is the way, the truth, and the life. And Jesus invited people along the way of discipleship, and so they called it the way. It was only called Christians in, in Antioch. It really was viewed part of the Jewish faith at that time. And so this way, he's part of the way, and Drusilla seems to know about this way, maybe even was a sort of a secret follower, whispers some words to Felix, and, and Felix enjoys listening to Paul. He enjoys listening to Paul. And, and then after Felix, for two years, Paul's there for two years. By the way, he was let out of that prison, and then was under house arrest. Isn't it nice that God gives you a beach break now and then? So Paul got to walk around the beach there, right there. It was, it's stunning. It's beautiful, beautiful beach. It is serene, still sort of a resort to this day. And uh, Roman leaders would go there because it was such a, a great resort. And so Paul got to interact with all these people sort of under this house arrest. And Paul never ran. Why? Because Paul got a chance to share his testimony. After two years, Felix left power, and then Festus came to power. And after him, Agrippa. And it's interesting because in each of these cases, Paul shares his testimony of faith. Now, it's interesting. We know that some lives were changed. But these leaders, Felix, Festus, Agrippa, Enjoyed listening to Paul. Paul is very intelligent, explained the scriptures, engaged with the philosophies of the day, but their lives weren't changed. They listened to Paul's testimony, they listened to the word, but their lives weren't changed. Kind of reminds you of Herod with John the Baptist, doesn't it? Herod loved listening to John the Baptist, but he didn't change his life. What a sad thing. Because Friends, I want you to know that the goal for God's Word, as we think about Bible Sunday, is not just to be informed by God's Word, but to be transformed by God's Word. I say that again. The goal is not just to be informed by God's Word, it's to be transformed by God's Word. And you can be engaged in it and ask questions, and you're invited to do so, because that's part of the life of faith and the life of discipleship. But unless you're transformed and you're growing in your discipleship and your life of faith, friends, and you know, you're in the place of Felix, Festus, Agrippa, Herod, so many others. You've got to be able to open your heart and life to God's Word as it grows and make room for that. Make it a priority in your life to follow God's Word through the power of the living Word, Jesus Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit, and the power of God's Word as we think about the life of faith. And I want you to think for a moment about this, because sometimes today we think about Bible Sunday, right? we realize that, well, in our, in our culture today, the Bible's not a priority. But I want to read again the scripture read earlier by Marcy from Romans chapter 1. And this is later when Paul is writing to Rome. And he writes this about his testimony of faith. He says, I'm a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and foolish, hence the eagerness to proclaim the gospel, you also who are in Rome. Paul's on his way there. But here's the most important verse, verse number 16 which is so powerful. He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I'm going to read it again. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation and to everyone who has faith, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Wow. And for all of us, I mean, I just got to ask all of us, are you unafraid and unashamed about God's Word. We talk about bringing Bible Sunday morning, and we give our Bibles to our young people, Bible Sunday and uh, coming up, uh, take your Bible, bring your Bible to school Sunday. How are you with your faith? And here's something that's interesting, too, to ask in the midst of all this is, if you were put on trial for your faith, would there be evidence to find you guilty? 
If you were put on trial for faith, would there be evidence to find you guilty? I hope there would be. I hope we'd all be found guilty of following God's word and doing what God would challenge us to do. Man, Paul is turning the world upside down, and so are other people. Peter, John, all these disciples, men, women, everyone is turning the world upside down because they're sold out. Their faith is sold out. Their passion level is sold out. They're using their gifts and talents and developing those, loving and serving God, loving and serving neighbor, and they have a level of resilience because they are empowered by the Holy Spirit to face challenge and adversity, and God is using that in amazing ways. In fact, God even uses Paul's Roman citizenship. As Paul is facing these questions and they're wondering what to do with this guy, and he's threatened at one moment. He says, I'm a Roman citizen and I want to go before Caesar. And they say, if Caesar is where you want to go, then to Caesar you will go. And the Holy Spirit is in that moment. Because even though Paul lost his life for his faith as a martyr of the Christian faith, Paul went before Caesar and was willing to share his faith in a way that rocked the world, that rocked the Roman Empire. And to all of us, I think maybe that's the goal, as we sometimes think about levels maybe of uh, renewal in the Spirit. And the first is renewal, right, or just receiving the, the good news of Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. We have that renewal per, on a personal level, right? And then we have like a, a reformation, it's our family and our church family where there's this reformation, right? And then ultimately, you can even have a movement like the Renaissance where culture itself is impacted. The early church, as it moved on, had a tremendous influence on the culture of the world. Now, sometimes the culture ended up compromising the church. You never want that. But then there was another renewal and reformation and renaissance as God spoke to people and they were moved in powerful ways. But it starts with each of us opening our hearts and lives to faith in Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit as we are enlightened, encouraged, and empowered through the Holy Spirit. How are you doing that today? Man, I think of a number of stellar people in the history of Christianity. We think of, of Martin Luther, and we think of Augustine, we think of Mother Teresa, and so many people who just set the world on fire, who turned the world upside down for their willingness to follow the Holy Spirit. And how are you and I doing that today? Well, just a, maybe a lesser level, but I, I always enjoy, I, I love sports, and so I watch many people who are Christians, and uh, the Colts quarterback, Sam uh, Ellinger, and he's a, he's a young man with great faith, and uh, the Colts picked him, he's been uh, doing a pretty good job as a, as a quarterback, but I think more importantly, he shares his faith every day, and he shot out um, a tweet the other day, and it had a, his Bible in it, shout out. Bible verse, and it's, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these other things will find their place, right? And that's win or lose, that's the most important thing. He shares that how when he was 14, he lost his dad. And that, what a blow that was to him, and he learned to lean on his faith. And then last year, he, he lost his brother. He was very close to his brother, and all those trials of faith. But he shares that it's his faith that got him through that. His faith that he's passionate about, more passionate about his faith than he is about being quarterback of the Colts or football, and he's very passionate about that. Using to use the gifts and talents he has, and, you know, if that puts him in a public arena, using his gifts and talents as a quarterback and being a, an NFL player, then that's a spotlight that he'll use for, for God's glory in a, in a humble way. And to be able to have the level of resilience that he was able to overcome the loss of his father when he was 14, loss of his brother last year, lost a game last week, and not just him, the whole team, but what did he say? Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God. God never promised us that everything would go our way or that everything would be smooth, but like Paul, God gives us a plan and purpose, and if we're willing to trust God, God is going to use the adversity that we face in life. The good things will come of it. The God's Holy Spirit will touch people's lives in ways that we never expected because we trust that promise that was given by Paul, given to Paul by the Holy Spirit that Paul shared to the church at Rome where he was on his way to. All things work together for the good of those who love God who have been called according to his purpose. And friends, I know personally, and you know personally too, that many times that promise is so hard to hold on to as we embrace 
go through some of the storms of life, some of the tragedies of life, some of the great disappointments and heartbreaks of life, that God's word is true. And you can hold his promises true and know that God will see you through. So today, when we celebrate Bible Sunday, I hope every Sunday is Bible Sunday, but we take a special Sunday out. And we celebrate Bible Sunday close to Reformation Sunday when Martin Luther was willing to stand up for God's Word and say, this is the importance of God's Word, that faith alone and Christ alone through God's grace alone is the way of salvation and remind us all of that and was willing to influence the world and turn it upside down. We think of other people like Mother Teresa turned the world upside down through love and service. Friends, God challenges us to do it today the same way they did, through the power of the Holy Spirit, through God's Word, and belief in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, as we think about the Apostle Paul turning the world upside down, and your challenge to all of us to turn the world upside down, Lord, help us to catch fire again with the passion of faith in you and the power of the Holy Spirit. Help us to be willing to use our gifts and talents to totally surrender them to you, to serving you and to serving our neighbor. And Lord, help us to be able to have a level of resilience through the power of the Holy Spirit to face whatever challenge and adversity that we do face in life, trusting you to not only get us through the storm, but to use that for good. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and all God's people said, amen.